Good afternoon. Welcome to the Federalist Society's conference on all things CFPB. I am Dean Reuter, Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. I'm very pleased to welcome you here today and then to fade into the background. Uh, my sole responsibility is to introduce uh, Brian Johnson. Uh, he is a partner at Alston and Bird's Financial Services and Products Group and the Consumer Financial Services team. More importantly, I think for our purposes today, Brian served as Deputy Director of the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where he was responsible for policy development, strategic planning, and execution of the CFPB's statutory supervision, examination, enforcement, rulemaking, and research activities. Uh, he conceived and led the creation of high-profile agency initiatives, including the Office of Innovation, the Task Force on Federal Consumer Financial Law, and the Call for Evidence RFI series, uh, policy, policy Symposia series, and Start Small, Save Up, Emergency Savings Program. So he had a lot on his plate in a short period of time there. Brian held various positions before that on Capitol Hill, including oversight of the activities of the CFPB, but also FSOC and the FDIC, uh, the Office of Financial Research, the OCC, the Federal Reserve System, and then NCUA, which is the National Credit Union Administration. He's earned his uh, BA in economics and his JD, both from the University of Virginia. And very importantly, he's the primary organizer of today's program. He's gonna uh, uh, act as our MC and moderator of everything we see today. So with that, uh, Brian, welcome. Thank you, Dean. Welcome and thank everyone for tuning in to today's event. Wednesday of this week, marks the 10 year anniversary of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau first opening its doors. This young agency was created by the Dodd-Frank Act, was born out of the crucible of the financial crisis, was the brainchild of then professor and now US Senator Elizabeth Warren. Congress granted the CFPB broad and novel administrative authorities over bank and non-bank financial institutions, and designed it to be highly independent from the political branches of government. Early leaders of the agency dubbed it the cop on the beat and sought to quickly establish it as a financial watchdog to be reckoned with. At the same time, the agency has been the subject of or affected by landmark legal disputes involving constitutional separation of powers questions like the scope of the president's recess appointment power and removal power and the legislative power of the purse, as well as other foundational jurisprudential concepts of federalism, fair notice, and due process of law. These issues and the CFPB's activities during three different presidencies have often been politically polarizing. Indeed, strong and enduring differences of opinion exist regarding the agency's policy decisions and the underlying philosophical considerations of the proper scope of American consumer financial regulation. Today, we aspire to rise above the partisan fray use the CFPB's 10th birthday as an appropriate opportunity to objectively evaluate the CFPB's legacy and future. We have assembled panels of former policymakers, leading academics, and distinguished legal practitioners with diverse viewpoints who have thought about, written about, worked within, and interacted with the CFPB throughout its history. They know the real CFPB inside and out, and we are fortunate that they will be sharing their experiences and insights with us today. Let us now turn to our keynote speaker, Kathy Craninger. Kathy became director of the CFPB in December, 2018. From her early days as a Peace Corps volunteer to her role establishing the Department of Homeland Security, to her policy work at the Office of Management and Budget to the CFPB, Kathy has dedicated her career to public service. She came to the CFPB from the Office of Management and Budget where she was policy associate director she oversaw the budgets for executive branch agencies, including the Departments of Commerce, Justice, Homeland Security, HUD, Transportation, and Treasury, in addition to 30 other government agencies. Previously, she worked in the U.S. Senate, where she was clerk for the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security on Capitol Hill. She also worked for the House Appropriations Subcommittee of Homeland Security, as well as the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. She served in executive branch posts with the Department of Transportation. There, after the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001, she volunteered to join the leadership team that set up the newly created DHS. 
Her work at DHS led to awards, including the Secretary of Homeland Security's Award of Exceptional Service, the International Police and Public Safety's 9-11 Medal, and the Meritorious Service Public Service Award from the United States Coast Guard. She graduated magna cum laude from Marquette University and earned a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. She also served as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine. Kathy, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Fantastic to be with you. Always also good to see you, Brian. So thank you and thank you to the Federal Society for hosting this forum. Well, if I slip and call you boss, uh, please forgive me for that. Um, so I will note that at the outset today uh, is not a keynote address, but rather a fireside chat. And since we're doing this remotely, we don't have a fire uh, aside which to sit. Um, but I uh, was quite interested um, in hearing about your background, maybe to start this conversation prior to the CFPB. Um, I read your bio, of course, which can't do that experience justice, but it undoubtedly you know, shaped your view of good government. Uh, you know, you were in uh, and around uh, different departments and agencies from a management perspective, you know, inside DHS as a startup, which is similar in some ways to the startup of, of CFPB, the youngest financial regulator. What is it about your background in government service that you thought best prepared you for walking into um, the CFPB director seat? Yeah. Well, it really is uh, certainly that DHS experience and that that startup uh, dynamic in government. There, uh, frankly, in history, are not that many opportunities to be involved at the beginning stages of an agency and really helping it form its mission. Uh, and I do feel pretty fortunate that I have been uh, in those seminal places in history and been able to to really be engaged. I think that's what makes public service most rewarding to me is really knowing that you are adding value, making a huge difference in helping the country and helping the American people and, and you know, doing you know, what, what is so important in these public service jobs. So certainly 9-11 was uh, a, a very catalyzing event, recognizing that we needed to do something fundamentally different in the standup of TSA, the standup of DHS, and I was also involved in standing up an office um, called the Screening Coordination Office at DHS. And so that, that history of everyone kind of coming together, the mission being core, having just great leaders that want to be involved and help. All of the stories that I, I talked to folks who were involved at the very early stages of the CFPB, from that small team at Treasury, uh, to those that, that decided to come over from other agencies, certainly experts in consumer finance from the outside, you know, that same experience and, and really that passion for the mission uh, is something that I can truly identify with and, and have felt uh, and enjoyed. I think the other thing, though, is, is definitely uh, the way that you work in government, uh, you know, for, for good or for bad, you know, you've got congressional committees they fight over jurisdiction, they create new agencies or new offices, and there are often tentacles to those other uh, either prior legacy agencies that, that might have had that responsibility before or shared jurisdiction. Um, the DHS had that. Early on, we had tons and tons of interagency meetings. I, I was at the White House regularly uh, on behalf of DOT and, and then DHS, but meeting with, with justice and meeting with um, uh, you know, transportation also and, and trying to figure out how those um, lines should be drawn and how the responsibility should work. Uh, the CFPB, I, I think in some cases, didn't really do that when it started off. And there was, there was uh, it's a continued effort that needed to happen when I came in to try to, again, continue to uh, make sure that it was part of the fabric of the financial regulatory system. And so I was, I was well versed in how that interagency world operates, how other agencies think about this. And the last thing I would say about just public service generally is the leaders who I have had the, the true fortune of working under who were truly motivated by uh, doing what was right. Uh, certainly there's a philosophical perspective that we all bring uh, and our own values. 
uh, but really making sure that doing right by the mission, having the law as the you know really guiding uh, document, seminal document, and what what is it that Congress told us to do, and how do we most effectively go about doing it, and you know manage people in a way that is consistent with with those values. Um, I had you know really I, I can speak certainly very affectionately about uh, Secretary Norm Mineta, who was the Democrat in, in Bush's cabinet, who chaired, uh, who was Secretary of Transportation and was really the first, you know, kind of key leader I worked under, just, you know, cared about people, showed that. Uh, you could not rush that man out of a meeting. It was really like, we'll take the time we need to take and I want to get to know you. And, and uh, you know, how, all of those things about how, how you best treat people and how that in the long run that actually helps you get things done. Uh, and as I said, I've been very, very fortunate to, to work around and with some pretty fantastic uh, people who showed that um, and just the way that he led transportation. And I, I saw it in, in many other uh, places that I worked in. Uh, certainly uh, many, many politicians are good people, people as well, which is a good, a good trait to have, but it really does matter on how you motivate and empower people and get them excited. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of uh, experience in, in watching that and doing that. And I think it served me well uh, coming over to the CFPB. And it's, it's what, you know, it, what's made, what makes it enjoyable and fun too. And the last thing I'll say is I had a, a colleague who was a very serious uh, you know, Coast Guardsman, went over to the civilian side, but whenever I said I had fun in the job, he'd kind of look at me funny and say, like, no, this is a duty. This is a you know responsibility. And I'm like, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't do it. So that's that's also part of part of the dynamic of finding that fun and finding good people uh, to work with. Well, speaking of uh, fun of the job, one important aspect of becoming director is, of course, going through the nomination and confirmation process. And I, I think you'd be maybe the first person I've heard discuss that uh, confirmation hearing um, as, as fun. Uh, they tend to be, I think, in this day and age, quite contentious. What, you know, walk us back to, to that point in time you were sitting at OMB. Um, at some point, uh, it became clear you were going to be the nominee. What's the, for folks who haven't been through that process, other than you know, myself on the outside looking in, it looks like a pretty painful process to, uh, you know, take a beating from senators who are, are usually, you know, sending larger messages than, uh, you know, maybe evaluating qualifications. What, what is that process like? What was your kind of experience there? What were your takeaways from that process? Oh, I, I'm lucky. I, I grew up with a pretty thick skin with three brothers. So, uh, I, I am able to take uh, the, that incoming flack and, and continue to plow forward because it, it is a an incredibly challenging process. There's no doubt about it. Some some for certainly good reason. And then when you're in a a truly politicized position like director of CFPB, which unfortunately you know I, I really did want to take that political temperature down around that job, but I, I don't think that's gonna happen in the long run. It was uh, certainly worth a try. You and I have talked a lot about that, uh, but, but being in that truly um, politicized role uh, was definitely challenging. Um, and, but, but again, things, uh, it makes, you know, if it's not hard, it's probably also not worth, worth undertaking. And so, this was something that uh, when I was approached about it, uh, I really had to think long and hard about it. You know, again, what, what, what you want to put your family through. There was a, a postcard campaign, which I shocked the heck out of me. I've spent my career working across the aisle uh, in every job I've ever had. I never care, frankly, where someone is, uh, if, if they want to actually find a solution and move forward that's what I love about policymaking. And so regardless of who you worked for, that was what I sought out. And to have myself painted as someone who was extreme or, or somehow irresponsible, uh, that, that is obviously something that, that you, know, you, you really do um, find it, find it uh, a little hard sometimes to move forward with and, and take with that grain of salt. So I feel really lucky to have great support 
um, harder to watch my parents, you know, and, and many people told me about watching their faces behind the, behind me during the hearing. Uh, but my family really is incredibly supportive of everything I've done. And, and look, I, I worked on the Hill. I worked in the administration. I have helped uh, numerous nominees go through the process. I've helped senators prepare for nominees and uh, done all of the, you know, kind of process for the, from the committee side on how nominees are managed. So this was something I, I knew well, was comfortable with. I knew what was happening on the other side of it. Uh, even when you're going through it yourself, that, that, that at least is helpful. And I'd say too, like many other people, talking about yourself is probably one of the most uncomfortable things that you have to do. Don't put subject matter in front of me. We can have debate and dialogue, but, but when you realize you're, yourself, you yourself are actually the, the source of this conversation and controversy, that part becomes uh, you know, also difficult to, to respond to. But, but look, the senators, as you said, they had, they had a job to do and they, they took the tack they decided to take publicly. Uh, I continue to maintain a lot of relationships on both sides of the aisle. I did not take uh, any of that personally in terms of, you know, internalizing it and seeking, uh, you know, to, to take future action as a result of how I was treated uh, and still continue to try to treat people the way I would like to be treated uh, and perhaps not uh, exactly the way they're uh, taking me on. So uh, it's, it's a challenging process. I'm hoping that, you know, people watching uh, my hearing aren't discouraged by it. I think that's the only concern I have about this. The nastier it gets, the less likely good people are to want to take this on, want to take the rec reputational risk, otherwise that, that comes uh, with it. But it is, public service remains something that I, I really value and I found rewarding. And so I, I don't regret it at all, but it is, it is a brutal process. <laughs> so let's fast forward. You, you navigated those waters successfully earned a confirmation vote. You know, you joined the Bureau in December, 2018, in the midst of the first major leadership transition in the agency's young history. You know, came in on, uh, after the you know, service of Acting Director Mulvaney, who had um, been an Acting Director for about the course of a year. What were, you know, coming into the Bureau uh, in that context, what were your First impressions of the agency when you walked in the door, started meeting the staff. Early on, you went on a listening tour, uh, you know, to visit um, each of the uh, regional offices for the agency and hear from staff, among other folks. What you know, if you think back to the, the early part of your tenure, what was what was your first impression of the bureau? That mission focus was absolutely the first. I, I know I talked a second about that, but that was very much uh, it came through. People cared about the mission. Uh, also, the ability to create an agency from whole cloth also means you get in a bunch of talented people, uh, frankly, and, and talented people that are really focused on that mission. So that was definitely the first uh, impression I had. But also then those parallels in, in the startup dynamic, you know, where, where are the uh, touch points, connections, deep relationships with peer agencies. You know, how do we operate? I'm, I'm someone that loves to get into, and, and that's why the listening tour was so important, but get into the uh, observation of how have things been done? You know, how do you think about them? Having those conversations one-on-one -on -one in small groups, you know, meeting the staff, meeting all of the partners that, that we worked with. And that was a great way to, to really dive in. Uh, so, so certainly they, they care about the mission. And then just all of the trust dynamics, which are unfortunate, but certainly stem from the history of the agency and its creation, uh, having come from, as you noted, the financial crisis, having the debate as to whether Republicans you know, even thought this agency should exist. Um, and I can tell you that I, I, I've, I think I have said this publicly before, but there there are many agencies, that, to my mind, that uh, probably confuse um, the effective operation of government and the effective carrying out of the mission uh, because there are just so many agencies. 
Uh, we're terrible in government. We create new things, but that we never actually uh, you know, downsize or, or stop doing things that don't work anymore and, and discontinue those things. So defunding something is pretty hard. Uh, so I don't have the CFPB at the top of my list of agencies that should not exist. I approached it as Congress decided they should. It's a mission that's important and we're going to carry it out. But that trust dynamic when I came in was certainly a question mark there. You know, what, what, is, what is this director trying to do? And, and, and you know, is it going to make sense? I think people were really looking for those signals from me. And I, I played it straight. I, I certainly hope uh, they took it that way. But I, I do feel like there were trust dynamics, um, particularly with some of the folks who have been at the agency from the beginning, um, and and really were wondering how that was going to look. So I was conscious of that, and I think yeah, approached things uh, pretty openly. Um, but but we also had to um, you know work through a lot of those issues, as as you well know, and um, certainly appreciate it, your role in, in all of this. At the same time, too, a lot of a lot of things to to move forward with and and, take care and address uh, during those early times, and and then. You know, just when we get our feet under us, we have the pandemic hit. So that was a whole other, whole other thing. Yeah. So, well, thank you for that, Kathy. Um, first, I, I guess a slightly different question or, or put a different way. So, um, you know, you said that sense of mission among the staff struck you as the strongest first impression. Um, what were the surprises? So as you dug deeper, as you got to know the place, uh, you know, either for better or worse, what were what were some of the biggest surprises you had? Yeah, I think one is just the the, the cultural uh, dimensions of the agency, having that startup beginning, but also not having taken the time to think through, you know, structure and kind of effective ways to operate as you mature uh, as an organization. Some of that is natural. Uh, frankly, it just takes time, and and there was a leadership transition. So good opportunity to think about that. That's also part of why I was, um, you know, put forward as the nominee was to, to really bring about that maturity of the agency. But a lot of, you know, kind of individual uh, people having the opportunity to, you know, revisit things or not sure, you know, what decision was made, the documenting of decisions, you know, all of those kinds of things that really do help people continue to move forward, continue to build on what's done before, um, and, and have a reason for those decisions. I think that that was one thing that I, I truly found as, as a challenge and, and that accountability uh, and empowering people. It's a lot of hesitation, a lot of, um, of uh, you know, individuals who were just trying to figure out what their role was vis-a-vis others and, and what their opportunity was to, to influence decisions. Uh, we saw a lot of those things um, early on. And so that, that was a big priority for me was, was really uh, making sure, one, that I was accessible uh, as a leader. Two, that we set up the systems that would empower people to do the job they've been hired to do. Um, that, that definitely was something. You know, I mean, you know this, um, and others said it, there, what, how decisions uh, were made uh, in the past. There was a, a big group meeting uh, where everybody was in the room, but you know, when you get a certain number of people in the room, it doesn't become an effective then decision making, um, you know, mode. Um, you know, it's it's a debate, and then they, you know, the opportunity to revisit later. So really, having that kind of a little more maturity, a little more structure to things, uh, I thought was important. Um, and that will take us to uh, just another thing. I know we want to talk a little bit about, but just this this philosophy around how an agency should should operate and kind of the, the uh, what what drives what risks uh, it sees and how it approaches risk management so the bureau uh, knew we had an enterprise uh, risk um, officer who we we hired uh, not too long before I happened to uh, actually know her in the past um, and a strategy office that had risk kind of as, a, as something that was important. But we really didn't have a structure at the Bureau for thinking about these things um, and, and certainly market um, dynamics. And so the question that, that uh, I was asked, and uh, you'll, I'm hoping you'll, you'll weigh in with your experience on this too, but basically was the, 
you know, what is what is the market problem that you want to fix? What what is the you know area of the market that you just want to reshape? Um, and and so again, it takes you to this coming in as a leader and coming in with the way I had been involved in my public service career. That's not generally what I'm expecting to get as a question from career staff. I'm expecting to get, hey, this is this is the framework we have in place for uh, identifying risks in the marketplace that are within our purview, and and here are the kind of the the, the solution sets that we could approach, you know, approach that. So that identification of risk, that thinking about, you know, what what response can we have. And, and also, what's the lightest touch response we can have that's going to uh, make sure that uh, regulated entities are compliant, uh, but yet still obviously have their own, um, you know, uh, control there in terms of how they execute their business, because that's, that is their right, uh, consistent with the law, consistent with the regulations. There are options for how market participants decide to comply. So that that dynamic of of you know is there a framework are there uh, is there staff that has actually thought about this has put some rigor to it uh, or is it a you know I just get to wave my magic wand and say I don't like you know this particular product um, and that's the you know that's what we're going to do we're going to go after this particular product or this particular segment of the market. Um, it was again. What what is the basis for those kinds of decisions, and how how should we put some more rigor and thought behind that? So, would you say that was unique in your experience coming, you know, from other agencies in terms of a, a focus or approach? The extent to which an individual director's you know preferences or preconceived notions play into the strategic you know, process or integrated into the risk management process of the agency? I would say it, it is, it is definitely something that you have the capability to do, but the challenge I think at, the, at other agencies, but the challenge of the CFPB is just the level of independence that the director really does have. Um, with other agencies, you know, you have the appropriations committees that can limit funding for different things. You've got a lot more um, touch points with the number of you know, confirmed uh, leadership in that agency. So a lot of back and forth with the Senate around what priorities are and how you're going to approach things because you wanna get your staff in. So you have to work with the Senate. Uh, so all of, all of those kinds of backs and forths with the Office of Management and Budget, with your peer agencies and interagency policy making, Really, none of that is is a, a factor of influence on the director. And then on this, the, the rigor of risk management, I, it is true. In government, some agencies are really good at it. Some agencies are just not and, and don't have as much rigor there. Uh, but in an agency with this much independence, I do think that this, uh, this conveying to the marketplace, you know, the way that we thought about these issues enabling, frankly, those entities, the vast majority of which want to comply, help them understand the way that the agency is approaching and thinking about these things is actually better for consumers. I mean, that's that's yeah. fundamentally what this is about, because it's about protecting consumers in the marketplace. Uh, and, and so that opportunity to, to share that risk management framework and thought process and uh, help uh, entities understand, help partners understand, so that we're not cross purposes with the FTC or with the FDIC or the OCC or others, that we are actually building up a, a system that's gonna be better across the board for consumers. That's the part that really should be a lot more transparent, a lot more rigorous. So you've, you've spoken a lot about you know, you, you viewed your task in many ways as trying to mature the agency through internal processes, through helping shape the culture you know, that that was formed as uh, you know a new government startup. You know, I always heard the kind of foundational lore of you know building a plane while flying it being the kind of organizing um, you know credo of the agency early on. You know. Where would you say in terms of the agency's kind of life cycle from pure startup to, you know, mature, 
you know, mainline kind of steady state agency, you know, 10 years on, um, it's interesting to think, I think it's no longer purely a startup, of course, but maybe not all the way towards, you know, mature agency. What's your sense of how close the agency is in that maturation process? Well, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, as you all know, I think for two reasons. One is the pandemic really did, uh, you know, set back a lot of the things that we would have liked to have done with culture. I uh, just gotten uh, the entire, at least Washington staff into one headquarters. So we were going to do a lot more to, to try to, um, you know, bring about much greater connectivity there uh, amongst folks not just based on, you know, who liked working with each other, but again, a little more structure around which uh, responsibility areas really people should be working together and aligned. So creating those uh, those touch points was a huge part of it, uh, certainly physically. You can do some of that virtually, but it helps when uh, people have actually met, interacted, can see each other. Uh, so that that's one aspect. And the other is then this transition, uh, absolutely because there is a a bit of churn happening, some of which is totally natural. Uh, The timing of, of, uh, you know, assuming that uh, the nominee actually gets through to be the new director, there's going to be some some, uh, timing dynamics there. So I think those two things make it hard to answer. Uh, I I hope, uh, and I certainly think we did everything we could to put the agency on better path with maturation, but uh, people don't like uncertainty. They don't like a vacuum. Uh, and so there is definitely a time period right now where many of the gains are, are sliding back a little bit just uh, because people are uncertain and, and unclear. And therefore, you know, all these uh, capabilities to try to bring people together, people tend to recede a little bit and just wait to be told what to do, uh, which I think is, is uh, at least from basic fundamental things of keeping an agency going and doing the good business that it should do, that's, that's problematic uh, for sure with that backslide. So um, I think it's, it's certainly on a path uh, and the, um, you know, the, the basics are there, but it really does take that care and feeding on an ongoing basis from management to really engage staff, to get them to come out of their shells, to get them to raise issues that they're seeing uh, from you know all the interactions they're having, and to have that kind of dialogue going. So I I I, I have hope I suppose, but I I, I fear it's not um, moving as much on that maturation as as you would expect, and just leadership vacuums uh, at different levels also make that hard. Well, speaking to that for a second, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't note the recent GovExec article, um, you know, discussing some of the personnel issues you had opportunity during your tenure to bring in senior executives of the agency. I guess the allegation is that some folks, unfortunately, in, in career service roles are being asked to leave or incentivized to leave um, to make room for new people. You know, what, from your perspective, what does that do for an organization's culture? How does that, you know, does that increase the uncertainty? Um, does it increase the kind of partisanship or at least the perceptions of, of partisanship within an agency as you you know, as you came in and looked to hire folks for the long term, um, just curious on on your thoughts on uh, what the implications that might be. Yeah, I certainly saw the the article. I know, you know, some of the folks who have made the decision to leave and for various reasons. Uh, Look, some of it is completely natural, as I just said earlier. Uh, I was, you know, when I when I came in, uh, you had preceded me uh, by a little while, but but it was kind of that natural time period. People had been at the agency seven years. Um, I had, you know, outgoing exit conversations with executives who decided to leave. And it, largely it was they had been there a long time. They're looking for a change. Uh, so some of it is is certainly natural. But People need to see that there is a, a you know, a, a path to refilling that, that you don't have actings upon actings uh, for too long. And so that there is that direction or really good communication, uh, again, uh, from the leadership of the agency and throughout the agency to, to make clear, you know, kind of what that path is and why. Again, it, it's completely natural. Also, well, you don't have a confirmed director to be 
pausing on some of these things. But again, is there a is there a conscious effort to explain that to people, to have that conversation and that communication? I think those things are are important. Uh, and I will, um, you know, I, I don't know what's happening right now on that front. So I have no insight which with to bring or, or I'm not bringing accusations, mostly just talking from my own experience about how important I think that communication is and the expectation setting for those who are acting uh, in terms of keeping, um, you know, keeping things moving, keeping people motivated and engaged. Uh, and that's something that, um, you know, that that accountability clarity around what uh, specifically the expectations are, I think is helpful all the way down the line. So you don't lose that connection between the director and, and those who are on the front lines carrying out uh, the mission. So I think that's, that's something that I would, I would certainly uh, suggest is, is important that, that they should, they should make do with. And then, you know, hopefully there, there is a plan. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time, on the hiring process, on succession planning, on gaps in skill sets that, that are important and necessary, trying to recruit a much more diverse pool of people in all aspects. Uh, frankly, I, I fundamentally believe that the, the civil service is, is best, um, you, you know, it's, it is strongest and best when you're bringing in, again, all of those vantage points. And, and so that, that I think is important. So, Hopefully, the uh, maintaining those lines of communications, maintaining that diversity in all of its forms, uh, is something that continues to be important to the leadership of the CFPB. I think that's an interesting observation because um, undoubtedly, a lot of your time was spent on those internal matters, on the processes, procedures, internal maturation, and the hiring process, which isn't really externally. Uh, you know, understood, I think, the extent to which agency leaders have to engage in that. Um, you know, it's easy to see consent orders, it's easy to see rules issued or press releases or, or new guidance, but some of the intangible work that, you know, builds an agency for the long term isn't, isn't necessarily known uh, uh, on the outside. Um, so I'm glad we had a chance to discuss that. I, I did want to turn a little bit to uh, successes, missed opportunities, you know, you've now had um, six months almost to the day uh, to, you know, reflect about uh, your time there. Um, uh, you know, maybe wish there had been some more time, um, but we'll, we can discuss Sela and, and other implications um, later. But uh, have you had enough time now to kind of think about um, what your game plan was, how you executed it, what you thought were the, the biggest successes and maybe what you wish you had more time to accomplish? Uh, definitely. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of time to reflect on those things, uh, certainly. Uh, but I think in terms of successes, it, it really starts with uh, the approach to managing the agency. And, and, and we've talked quite a bit about that. So I can set that aside, but I, I think that that mattered a lot to me. Um, in terms of uh, substantive actions, our innovation agenda is something that I was uh, incredibly uh, proud of that I think really set the tone for the way that we wanted to approach things too, because it's recognizing that, you know, the, the only way that we can truly bring financial inclusion forward and, and um, you know, it's, it's supporting the best characteristics of the market and, and the market truly is um, you know, driven by innovators. It's driven by uh, entrepreneurs. It's driven by people thinking about new and different ways to do things. And regulation, uh, in some ways, inherently, uh, just holds that back. So how do you think about um, ensuring compliance, ensuring protection as those things continue to change? Um, and for anyone who's tried to draft laws, you know it's impossible to do at that level. As you try to draft regulations, it's you know, easier than writing a law to, to accommodate those kinds of things. But thinking of everything uh, through that process is, is really challenging. So recognizing there needs to be some flexibility. I think our innovation policies are at the top of the list. And I, I really hope uh, that this gets a serious look um, from uh, you know, the new leadership when they come into the agency and that they can continue 
uh, those innovation policies. We, we really were very incredibly thoughtful about the way we went about it. Uh, we were incredibly transparent about the way we went about it. And uh, I think opened up a lot of opportunities for companies to, to really be able to move forward, to show investors they're moving forward in a responsible way and to encourage people to come forward and work with regulators. I mean, that, that is not something that, um, you know, is foremost on probably many entrepreneurs, you know, minds. You know, they're thinking about how to build a company and, and build the very cool thing that's going to help consumers and, and help their customers. And so this, this uh, working with the government and, and the concerns that would come from, you know, sticking your head up too high and saying, oh, yes, I'm doing something different. You know, what, you know how do I go about this in a smart way? Um, you know, there are so many historical examples of them getting smacked back being just like, no, you can't do that. Um, so how, how we interacted, um, I, I think it's incredibly important for government to continue to evolve and regulators to continue to evolve. And we've got some great, uh, great things there. The second thing I would say is just the, the issues where there were not clear, you know, political lines in the sand. Um, it was uh, incredibly rewarding to get the QM rule out, uh, to really have the conversations around that, to start uh, the 1033 process too, um, and recognizing that that 1071 is also a very challenging area, um, but it is a congressional mandate. Getting that started in earnest, uh, substantively, and really starting the roadmap there. Uh, so those were things that were on my uh, agenda and plate. You know, we didn't get to finish them. Um, I admittedly, in a in that two year span, I knew we weren't going to finish them if if that was the only time we had. Uh, but really setting a tone for that um, direction and, and bringing that transparency to all of the processes as the default way the CFPB would operate is actually that communication with advocates, with industry, with anyone who wants to talk to us. This is how we're approaching things. This is how we're thinking about things. What do you have uh, to add to that? You know, what are we not, what are we missing I think that, again, that uh, humility, transparency, engagement uh, is something I'm, I'm very proud of. And, you know, I covered in there a little bit of things that were uh, unfinished, but, you know, that's that's the nature of time. Yeah. Uh, nature time. We'll get to Sela in a second, but um, obviously your, your tenure as directed and ended in, in January. If uh, hypothetically you could go back and brief yourself circa 2018, um, you know, lessons learned time, what, what would you tell yourself? What, you know, if, if there was something you had done differently or had, you know, advanced uh, knowledge of, you know, would that have changed in any way, you know, the way you approached uh, being director or the timetable recognizing, you know, that um, five years isn't always five years uh, in, in this day and age, um, you know, kind of lessons learned, what do you think uh, you would you would tell your younger self? Well, I, I, I'm a huge believer in the serenity prayer. I, I think there are many things in life that we wish we could control that we cannot control. And, and clearly the, the beauty of that and, and coming to Zen with it is actually knowing the difference uh, when it's in front of you. Can I control this or can I not control this? And, and that... Um, you know, I think that's that's a, a just a perpetual challenge uh, in general. So I, I think, um, look, th this position um, being CFPB director and the amount of autonomy that you had, uh, the amount of um, really the, the ability to just execute and go on things, uh, it is a tremendous power. And I uh, approached it though with a recognition that if, if anything is going to last beyond my term, uh, that these are not things that I can take lightly and ramrod through. Um, so it really was a, a concerted effort to um, engage uh, and try to bring uh, staff in on things. Again, no, no question is, is a question I won't answer. Um, how do we continue to, to keep moving forward and uh, understanding each other? So those, those, those are the things that certainly guided uh, the way I approached it. So I, I'd say I, 
I, I certainly wished I could have created uh, more time for some things to get done, uh, but I do feel good about, uh, about the approach that I took. And there was a drive, but uh, amongst the things you cannot control is, again, people and what happens in their own lives and what decisions they make uh, about what they need to be doing. Uh, and so it's, you know, people who make the decision to depart, uh, who you uh, really were counting on to take a leadership role in something. Uh, when you're, you know, an agency head at this point with 1,500 staff, I can't dive in and literally just go work every single problem myself. So I think that that whole personnel uh, dimension of people coming and going, um, you know, and making the right call. I, I spent a lot of time on that. So I, I and I recognizing, frankly, that that was the only way also to, to kind of span um, the agency's responsibilities and, and carry that out. So that's also, uh, you know, something that just was hard. If somebody decides to go, you're like, great. Now that, <laughs> that thing that I was really uh, counting on is, is, um, uh, is challenging. How are we going to adjust? Uh, who do we need to bring in? Uh, and, and all of that just takes so much longer. So I, I would say uh, probably some remaining frustration around um, some of the personnel processes that, that still don't work as, as well as they should have. And I'm, I made a, a huge commitment to the management side of things, recognizing this, you know, the CFPB has a lot of flexibility in how it decides to budget, how it decides to hire, uh, could be a true uh, guinea pig for more innovation in those government management processes because it's the right size, because it has the right authorities. Um, and so we did some of that. Um, we did a lot in, in different areas, but there's still a more to be done there. Um, and that, heck, if someone had done it for me, my job would have been a lot easier too. Uh, but it just the nature of, of where the agency was and its maturation. So um, hopefully that does benefit um, the agency in the future. So I've foreshadowed Sela. Let's walk back to that decision. It fell upon you to decide which position the agency would take, join DOJ or not join the position of the administration regarding fairly consequential separation of powers issue. Can you walk us through you know, your thoughts on the considerations there? Obviously the position you ultimately took was contrary to self-interest. Um, in, term, in terms of what, you know, I guess most observers have anticipated could have been one of the consequences, which is uh, you know, the decision of the portion of the statute that imposes conditions on the president's ability to remove a director from office. Any thoughts on the decision you made and, and how it played out? I'm, I'm actually curious also to learn about, you know, the end game there, which is, you know, a new incoming administration, the Biden administration made a decision under their authority post SALA to um, make a change. Um, I don't know, frankly, how that works or how it happens in practice. And maybe it's certainly unique in the CFPB's history um, post SALA. So any, any thoughts on um, the case itself, you know, the, the process of reaching your decision and then the aftermath, I'll call it. Yeah, well, it was certainly one of the you know big looming issues when I was considering even the nomination for the position. Um, I, I have tended to uh, you know move through different government positions and 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 feel like I had once I had kind of conquered an area, I I wanted to move on and see something from a different angle. So committing to a five year term was probably one of the larger things about this job. Um, that I had to consider uh, as part of the process. At the same time, with with this decision looming, it was also uh, very clear that that it may not actually be a, a full term that I would serve, uh, depending on election outcomes. So it was something that was very much you know on my mind uh, through the confirmation process. I had many people ask me about it. I said, look, I, I know it's going to be a big decision before me, but I'm I'm not making that call right now. I certainly needed to benefit from talking with the agency's attorneys once I got in um, and, and really uh, examining the merits of the case as it actually you know, made its way to a point where I needed to make that decision. Uh, so as, as you know well, uh, we came to that point 
uh, in the summer of, of 2019, having to make the call about what, um, you know, I, I guess maybe it was a little later. So I forget exactly when, frankly. Now, COVID, COVID makes time just kind of <laughs> all muddled together. Um, but the timeline of, of, of having to really consider that and think about it came um, as the DOJ was taking its position facing uh, the potential that the Supreme Court would take up the case. Uh, so that was really the timing. Uh, the agency does not have the ability to um, appear before the Supreme Court on its own and, and represent itself uh, without DOJ's allowance of that. And so were we going to seek uh, a different position? Were we going to uh, concede to or agree to the uh, DOJ's position? How was this going to work? Um, so I, I did have the opportunity to think about that a lot. And, and the independence of the position uh, was certainly something that I, I then had a decent amount of experience with. And uh, fundamentally for me, uh, I, I think that uh, the independent agencies, there really is a lot that we should be thinking about in terms of how that truly fits in uh, a constitutional structure with three branches and uh, separation of powers and the and checks and balances that happen amongst those three branches. Uh, and then you have these, these independent agencies, where do they fall in, uh, what, um, what power does the, the president have to execute the agenda that he was elected on, given what can happen in these other agencies? And uh, it, it was interesting. I said, I started conversation earlier about my interagency experience. And you know, all of that comes to a head with the decision from the president. And here I'm now part of this whole structure off to the side uh, that, that does not actually go in that direction. Uh, and on top of that, you've got the, the role of, of Congress that, that um, you know, I had to appear uh, four times a year. Uh, but other than that, there were no controls uh, specifically over um, my activity. So I, those things certainly uh, influenced my thinking on this, uh, on this case. And I, I felt strongly that, that um, you know, I, at least with the director of the CFPB, I will speak more broadly about independent agencies. The president should have the ability to remove without cause. I also thought through this presidential transition now that it, it was a reality. You know, without that ability by the president, what would that do to the system? I mean, we have a very politicized agency. What is that going to force them to bring cause somehow against someone who? Uh, otherwise is, is truly a qualified and duly appointed uh, and confirmed director. So a lot of dynamics around this that just led to just very perverted uh, potential paths. Uh, if you don't just acknowledge that the president should be able to remove a director, recognizing that they don't you know, have, share the same philosophy or values or uh, direction for the agency. Um, so I, I felt like from that standpoint, it was an easy decision the communication to the workforce, uh, how that might have cut across uh, and trying to manage you know, how they saw that decision. Uh, and I very much separated that decision from what, you know, what the agency's mission was and, and where the agency needs to be. Uh, I think it was a, an important one and a discrete decision that could be made uh, very clearly in line with the constitution. And so the Supreme Court obviously made, uh, made its ruling and that led, uh, as you noted, to, to obviously the, the president asking for my resignation uh, right away uh, upon uh, his um, oath of office. So that was a fairly quick process. Um, how that came about, uh, I, I'll admit I was a little surprised by this. I was, I was seeking some conversation um, you know, in kind of late December, early January, just to say, what are you thinking? Uh, I am responsible for this agency, its mission, its 1,500 staff, uh, its succession and continued ability to carry out its mission during this time period. You know, do we do we need to have any conversations about um, what direction you want to go, what direction you want me to go, and how this will work? And I think, again, politics probably played out a little bit, uh, unfortunately, as I think, because I've had 
so many people ask me, oh, how do you transition this? You know, did you did you meet the person that was replacing you or like, how, how does this work? And the, the answer is no, that didn't happen at all. Uh, in fact, you know, again, the, uh, the president's right to name an acting uh, of his choosing consistent with the Vacancy Act. And and uh, I uh, did ask the question, but I was told that that was not any of my concern as to who I was handing it off to. Um, so for a few hours, the succession plan of the agency that I had signed was in effect. Um, and and frankly, that wasn't even conveyed to the staff of the agency. Um, so leadership knew that that was what was going to happen. But again, dealing with the political sensitivities, I wasn't going to go out and make some big proclamation about who my successor was. Uh, and and nor would I want that person to be then, you know, have their legs cut off for it being only a few hours uh, of, of power. Uh, so it's just a, it's, a, it's an odd dynamic, uh, less transparent than you'd want it to be, very much uh, based on personal relationships in terms of, you know, uh, me reaching out and saying, what plans do you have? And can I at least have some kind of heads up? Um, if I had not reached out, I have every expectation that the email I got at, you know, I forget exactly what time, 11.30 a.m. Uh, on the 20th, would have been my first indication. Um, yeah. that, that, and so that, I, I think there are better ways to do these things, but I'm also sensitive to the uh, challenges that the other side was facing there too. Well, Kathy, thank you. I, I see we're bumping up on the end of the hour. One quick rapid fire question. Do you care to share anything about your future plans? Yes, uh, I, I unfortunately cannot name the company, but I can tell you there's an announcement uh, coming this week, and I am in this. I'm joining the startup world here, uh, which is something I'm really excited to be joining the private sector in. It is a crypto native company that is looking to make uh, digital asset markets uh, more transparent to uh, identify uh, fraud and um, market manipulation uh, in digital asset markets and really help uh, enable uh, mainstream inst institutions and, and others to join uh, this marketplace. So fantastic uh, to be part of this world and, and more coming uh, on that. Well, congratulations, best of luck. Um, and thank you so much for, for joining this discussion. I had a great time. Um, and thank uh, everybody for um, joining this first hour. Uh, we'll move now to a short break for next session, which is what is the CFPB's legacy? It begins at promptly at 1 p.m. Eastern in two minutes. Please note that to join our next session, you'll need to use the registration link that is specific to the next session. If you haven't registered yet, check the event page of the, on the Federal Society's website where you can register. We'll see you all again soon uh, in a matter of moments. And until then, we are adjourned. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.